So, uh, yes, yeah, so I've been increasingly getting interested in uh, future constructions, um, mostly because there's so much variation there. And um, so I've been trying to pinpoint where you find the variation. And then since I'm uh, particularly interested in um, diachrony, I've been trying to um, do sort of the first steps in understanding the historical sources and developmental paths of future constructions. And uh, I've been limiting myself to the Northwestern, or uh, formerly also called Old Kuki languages. Um, and even that, even though that's not that many languages, it's still a huge amount of um, different constructions that we find. Um, so even though uh, it's, it's a rather small focus, um, so right now I'm still at the stage of just sort of um, collecting the information that we have and kind of sorting through it um, and I'm really just kind of at the stage that I'm able to sort of ask the relevant questions as you'll see. Okay, um, I'll be showing you two, I'll start with two constructions that are particularly widespread. Um, that's on the one hand um, a construction that I just call the, the new Ni future construction. So it's um, based on this form Ni that uh, no doubt you'll all recognize as the equational copula. And the other type of construction uh, consists of a form te or ti, which is actually the verb to say. Uh, and uh, there I'll go into a bit more detail because that's something I worked on from one song in particular. And then we'll just go into sort of uh, jump into sort of the diversity and I'll just want to expose you to a bunch of different forms um, just so you get an impression of how much variation there is. Um, okay. So the knee future constructions um, are, so this is, I'm just limiting myself to, to the Northwestern Subbranch. So in the modern languages of the Northwestern subbranch, the ni future construction is only in negative, only found in negative context. Um, I will make a case for reconstructing it also as a construction that used to be used in affirmative context, but the modern languages only have it in negative context. Um, the te or ti future constructions are only occur in affirmative context, so we have sort of a bit of a complementary distribution of these two types of constructions. Um, and then again, so this is just kind of how I will, in which order I will talk about these constructions. And um, all in all, the overarching theme that will be, you know, uh, becoming more and more clear is that negative future is a relatively conservative context where we don't have that much variation. And affirmative future is a remarkably innovative context where we have just lots and lots of variation um, and we'll be, you'll be seeing the parameters along which these uh, innovations have occurred. Okay, so uh, as I just said, affirmative future expressions are highly innovative. Uh, we find a spectacular amount of non-paradigmaticity in the sense that, you know, if you try to elicit a conjugation paradigm uh, you'll find that there are different constructions for different person forms, um, sometimes even different constructions for intransitive versus transitive affirmative future. Um, and uh, to a large degree, the, the functional basis of a lot of these innovations is uh, that there seems to be just sort of a drive to kind of find new expressions to, to particularly express um, intentionality. That's often sort of a starting point for constructions that then become full-fledged future constructions. Uh, there seems to be sort of a particular concern with epistemic authority. That's kind of my story for how this direct speech construction becomes um, a future construction. And then um, typically also before like some future constructions uh, are in the first stage just in a spectral construction that express immediacy. So something is about to happen that isn't necessarily a future yet and we'll be seeing that also. Um, and then sort of uh, it can grammaticalize to a more general ordinary future. Um, so that seems to be, uh, you know, just finding new ways of, you know, 
particularly referring to something immediate or to intention, that's sort of what drives sort of, I think what sets, you know, a new construction sets it off to then, you know, possibly become um, a more general future construction. Uh, and then the negative future expressions, like I said, that's most, that's a very conservative cont relatively conservative um, context. Uh, and the conjugation forms we find there is that usually we have a full conjugation paradigm that all looks the same, like it's all based on the same marker and also the person indexes are fairly regular. Um, so we see um, a pretty good difference here. Okay, there's a bit of an exception because uh, transitivity can, can mess things up. So um, in, tra in transitive um, slash nominalized contexts, which are often kind of um, go together, uh, there we may also find innovative constructions in negative future. Um, that would be sort of the exception. Okay, so here are our Northwestern languages and uh, sort of grouped into four really just impressionistic groupings and um, I've, I'll be showing you data from the languages in red and blue. The, I put Biate in blue because it's uh, really had very limited data but uh, it does fit sort of the pattern um, that um, of sort of the constructions that we also find in other languages. Um, I could have also included uh, Chote and Tarao, but there's sort of more complicated stuff going on, so I kind of left that out for now. Uh, okay, so the basic knee construction, um, as I said, occurs in negative future paradigms, um, sort of formulae, clear schematically, it uh, looks like um, what I have listed here under one. So you have the lexical verb, then the negative marker, and then you have an inflected form of, the, of this knee, historically equational copula, um, and sort of variation in two different types of negative markers you can have here. And then what's under two, that's really just Lamkang. <laughs> so Lamkang is just a bit different from everybody else. Um, but so basically we'll be going with the structure in one. And uh, what this looks like, you'll see here. Um, so this is Monsang and uh, C to go, Ma the negative. And then you have this inflected form of Ni. Um, it's the post rebel set of person markers, uh, which means that we have something truly post rebel for first person, so Ing and Ung. Uh, and then this inclusive me and second person te, those are these forms that are um, reconstructed to be originally pre-verbal within the post-verbal paradigm, okay? Um, so this is a particularly conservative paradigm, which we also know because of these uh, te and me pre-verbal forms within the post-verbal set. Um, so that also helps us to, to recognize just kind of the how archaic this uh, type of conjugation is. Okay, um, this is Monsang. Chiru looks um, really similar. We just, you know, here we have C for first person singular, C ma ning, and here we have mei no ning, okay? So we have a different verb. And then no instead of ma for negation, but then again, ning, di ni, and ni. Um, so that's kind of the same as in Monsang. Uh, now we move to, so those were Chandil languages, Chandil district. Um, now we have some languages here of, um, so the Barak Valley area uh, in uh, southern Assam. So here is Saifrim and it works the same way, okay? Se no ning, se no ni che, it's the same, same basic idea. Uh, Frankol works the same. Okay, there's a bit of variation, especially in the second person forms, um, um, just the, the person markers for second person, um, but otherwise it's all extremely similar. Here's Chore, looks really, again, the same, okay. Sakachep, Ning, Niti, okay. Ranglong. So the only variation you really see is in, in the second and third person forms, the first person forms are really uh, extremely similar. And then here's also an example from Biate that again looks the same. And here's our Lamkang. And as I said, Lamkang is different from everybody else. Uh, somehow in Lamkang, the position of the negative 
and the knee is switched, <laughs> but otherwise it's the same again. Okay. I don't know exactly what the mechanism for Lamkang is, how it kind of uh, switched. Like the obvious explanation would be that it's somehow an analogy to other types of conjugations, but I'm I'm not exactly sure. So now the question for this knee construction is whether we can reconstruct a source construction that would be sort of the negative future knee construction at the level of proto-Northwestern. Okay, does it really reconstruct to one single source construction and then all the modern languages just have, um, you know, an inherited kind of form of it? Um, and the question whether we can really reconstruct a full source construction, um, that hinges on whether the variation can be explained as just sort of subsequent changes to one inherited form or not, um, and kind of boils down to kind of how well we can account for the variation just in terms of sort of subsequent um, developments. Um, and even though it really looks all extremely similar and certainly compared to the affirmative forms, it's extremely similar, there actually is um, still quite a bit of variation. So uh, we have two different negative markers, like we saw, the ma and the no. Um, the position and form of plural marking is different. So we have the u plural marker and this hey, hey, hi, whatever it is. Um, and that can either attach to the lexical verb or at the end of the whole string. Um, then, as I've been mentioning, we have the position and form of um, the second person markers and the inclusive. Um, and sort of, um, it's still kind of, so I'm, I'm um, like all of these things would have to be checked sort of across the different conjugation paradigms. And then we can decide, okay, in this language, it's just always the case that the postverbal second person form is che and te, and so it's not particular to this construction. So it can still be the case that we can reconstruct really a fixed source construction and you know the variation that we find is just kind of subsequent um, development. Um, but um, anyway, it's, it's, it's not obvious that we can um, really reconstruct um, the whole construction or if it's instead something um, that, uh, you know, so if the opposite, um, or the, the, the alternative hypothesis would be that it's um, a construction that spread through language contact would sort of be the, the obvious alternative, okay? So it's, it's, not, um, it's not so clear which one it is at this point. Okay, so the basic need construction, um, by that I mean that uh, there's no other marker other than ni, and as I said, this is the most common for negative future. Um, affirmative future constructions generally are not based on ni. There are fossils, but we can sort of ignore that for now. Um, and what I want to um, discuss now, uh, taking data from Monsang, is that ni actually is a major future construction that used to exist for both negative and affirmative contexts. Um, and we can do that based on just internal reconstruction within Monsang. Okay, so in Monsang also, I showed you the knee construction for negative future, um, but we have a knee construction also in an affirmative context, and there it's the imperfective uh, intransitive conjugation. I'll show you that in a second. Um, that provides evidence that this used to be a construction also used in affirmative context. And then there's also evidence from subordinate clause and from a desiderative construction in the language. So I'll briefly go over this um, here. So this is, uh, if you remember, it looks extremely similar to what we had for negative future. So negative future was basically exactly these forms except with the negative ma, okay? Um, and kind of the reason why this is not just the exact affirmative counterpart is A, it's not future, but imperfective more generally. It's okay, so this would just be I'm going and not I will go, and so on. Um, and the other way in which it's different is that it's um, only intransitive verbs that work that way. Okay, transitive verbs work differently. Okay, so it's morphosyntactically restricted, only works for intransitive verbs, and it's not uh, the same function. It's not future, but it's imperfective more generally, okay? So it's kind of 
related in a way, okay? Um, okay, but this is exactly like I would reconstruct that this is exactly the form of the future affirmative construction. So historically, sinning would have been I will go, okay? And you could have had the equivalent for, uh, you could put a transitive verb in there as well, say sa to eat. I could say sa ning and it means I will eat. Okay, that's kind of the proposed reconstruction, that these forms are future constructions and they work both for intransitive and for transitive verbs. Okay. Uh, evidence for this comes from subordinate clause, uh, the way subordinate clauses work. Okay, so here uh, we have a transitive verb uh, to kill. And you can indeed just say thinning. Uh, if you add this um, conditional if, then you get, um, you know, uh, I kill, but obviously with this future sense because it's a condition. Um, okay, so in subordinate clauses, you can have ning following a transitive verb, which you cannot in for a main clause verb. So thinning by itself is ungrammatical, it's unacceptable. But if it's uh, in a subordinate clause, thinning be, that's fine. Okay, so in subordinate clauses, we still have the form that I would reconstruct with the future meaning in a sense. Uh, and there's a desiderative construction in the language um, that works this way. Sending at the nut means he wants to eat. And this is evidence that Ning is a first person singular future form. And the reason why this is evidence. Um, for reconstructing Ning as a first person singular future form is because it is actually a construction that historically um, I call a reported intentionality construction. Reported intentionality is a construction where you use um, reported speech. Okay, so this is the construction um, we'll be talking about more in detail later. Um, this is a construction that is uh, has ambiguous um, uh, kind of, um, yeah, an ambiguous uh, translation. So it can either be, uh, he says I will eat, or he says he will eat, or he thinks I will eat, or he thinks he will eat, um, or he wants to eat, okay? So it reports the intention of somebody to do something. And here, sort of in the synchronic report intentionality construction, we have sakite, which is um, a type of first person singular future form. And Saning started out like a reported intentionality construction, but then grammaticalized to be specifically only marking desiderative. Okay, so it was sort of the ambiguous type of construction that we see on top, uh, but now narrowed down to be specifically only um, expressing desiderative. Okay, he wants to eat. And this type of reported intentionality construction that can have these different translations, um, that's actually cross-linguistically uh, reported to always have the same form, that it's reported speech, and what is reported is a verb form that is first person saying the future. Okay, so all this to say just that this name here um, can be argued very well to be a first person singular future form, okay? Used here in an affirmative context. Okay, so we have basically this um, sending at the not form that used to be a reported intentionality construction now being just the desiderative and sort of a new construction becoming reported intentionality, okay? Okay, so um, this was a bit sort of <laughs> nitty gritty of Monsang uh, morphosyntax, but basically this shows that even though in Monsang uh, synchronically we don't have ni um, sort of as the general affirmative future construction, we can reconstruct it from Monsang actually, okay? Based on these three pieces of evidence I just showed you across three different morphosyntactic domains. And it's actually not unexpected that um, the, that in affirmative main clauses um, that the meaning would have shifted from future to imperfective and that it's restricted to intransitives because main clauses are the main morphosyntactic domain where innovations happen um, and subordinate clauses um, as it sort of true subordinate clause, clauses or this desiderative construction where it's inside reported speech, um, that would actually be expected to be conservative or where we would expect to find fossils because those kind of contexts often preserve uh, original forms. So this kind of um, fits actually. So in Monsang, 
um, just based on internal reconstructions, just based on what we find within Monsang, uh, it's really possible to make a case that the new construction is the original, just basic future construction of the language that was used both, both in affirmative and negative contexts. And basically now it's restricted to negative context because affirmative contexts have been innovated. Okay. Um, the next question based on that uh, is how, whether we can extrapolate from Monsang to all Northwestern languages. So um, is it the case that we can reconstruct uh, Ni also as the main future construction for Northwestern in general? Um, and I would say kind of maybe, sort of at first it makes sense that, you know, if we look at pre-modern Monsang, you know, and kind of assume that Northwestern isn't, you know, doesn't go back to such a great time depth than pre-modern Monsang, could sort of, we could sort of intuitively assume that that's kind of the same time depth as Proto-Northwestern. Um, but sort of, you know, on second thought, it's, it's probably not the case. Um, kind of first, because you'll be seeing lots of variation in affirmative context. So, you know, to say that now all of these languages have different affirmative future constructions, but, you know, at the stage of Proto-Northwestern, there was really just one construction. Doesn't really make sense, right? Like if there was that much variation around today, you would assume that that's just, you know, that these languages are just happy to innovate um, future or especially future affirm affirmative constructions. Um, so you, I would uh, be happier to uh, reconstruct also variation, kind of, and make the, you know, assume that the proto-language was similar to the modern languages. Um, and then the other reason is that uh, the new construction is actually unlikely to be that old, that it's really the future construction of um, proto-Northwestern, because we still have the grammaticalization source of ni, the equational copula, is still around, right? And that's kind of a general sort of uh, um, rule that if you still find the source of the grammaticalized construction around, then presumably it's not actually that old, right? Um, so, okay, so probably not. <laughs> it's probably not that easy, kind of. Um, but just to show this also, we have uh, Ni as the affirmative future construction, just plain that in uh, Northeastern, actually. So Paite has, um, you know, for both intransitive and transitive verbs, has just this uh, inflected Ni as the future construction um, for first person and second person, okay, or, like all persons, but um, it's kind of important because first person Ning can kind of go off in different ways, so it's, it's also the case for other person forms. Okay, um, and then this I already mentioned, so the new construction presumably is our, would be reconstructed as being based on the equational copula that we find everywhere, um, also in Northwestern, for example, in Chiro, but also in other languages. And again, the fact that it's still a copula in all these languages, or in lots of languages, suggests that ni as a future marker is not that old, okay, so that would go against... Um, the whole reconstruction of Ni as the main future marker at the level of Proto-Northwestern. The source construction is um, likely to be an obligation or predestination construction. So in uh, the cross-linguistic study on tense aspect mood systems uh, by Bybee et al., they discuss equational copula-based constructions to mark future as the third most common source uh, for future in their sample of, uh, you know, really like cross-linguistic. Um, and so something like uh, that can indeed be sort of literally translated into English as I am to go now. Um, so that type of a predestination construction would be the likely way this grammaticalized. So first uh, to an intention construction and then sort of a more general future construction. Okay, that was me. Uh, now, T or T constructions. Um, so I already showed you the desiderative construction and uh, said that this is linked to or originates in a reported intentionality construction that's really based on reported speech. Nowadays, if you know you sit down with a native speaker and show them this construction, uh, they just say Ning means want and T is also just an auxiliary in this construction. They don't recognize this to mean to say or think. It's not reported speech anymore at all. It's just 
the way you say I want to eat a stunning kitana. It's you know it's all fused and opaque um, for native speakers. Um, but this desiderative construction is extremely similar to the basic future. So uh, the way you say I will eat in Monsang is savankite. Okay, so you don't have this na at the end, but that shouldn't bother us right now. So it basically works um, analogously. Okay, savankite, I will eat. Uh, and this te I already um, said, but just to kind of um, show it also. Uh, so here we would understand it as an auxiliary, but it's uh, very obvious that it comes from the word, the verb to say, okay, which is also a lexical verb still in Monsang. Okay, so this is just an example for direct speech. Um, okay, so they now again said our work exists or we have work. Okay, so this is just how you do direct speech in Monsang. Okay, so this te is really just the verb to say. And this is the full future affirmative paradigm in modern Monsang. Um, something funny, presumably fused going on in the inclusive and third person forms, but in first and second, we can see very clearly that it's the lexical verb followed by vang and then inflected form of te. Um, and so te is again to say. Vang, I assume at this point um, that it's a combination of um, va, and this is sort of uh, hooks on the discussion of what we had that we had this morning because usually the directionals are all preverbal. So here we would have to assume then that it's also possible for directionals to occur in a postverbal position. Um, the ng at the end could be first person singular. Um, the other option that I don't want to necessarily actually exclude is that it, it could also be. Uh, some kind of non-final marking, actually. Sort of, there's this ing, right, of like marking adverbial verbs, adverbial, um, yeah, sort of, you know, non-finite verbs um, can also be marked with ing, so it could actually also be that. Um, okay, so again, what I just said, so wouldn't we expect a directional marker in pre-verbal positions? So actually, this example I showed you before, um, we have here this va, and that's sort of the in the set of uh, preverbal directionals. Um, so I'm not sure, but basically, uh, as uh, David also reported this morning, uh, post-verbal directionals are reported and are not that unusual either in uh, South Central. So it's um, possible that basically somehow you had a set of both and they kind of grammaticalized in different ways so that you would have sort of true um, directionals in pre-verbal position and then in post-verbal position. Somehow it's these things that grammaticalize to other functions, like here the future marker, um, maybe. OK, so Monsang actually has kind of a proliferation of these te-based constructions. So we have savankite, I just showed you, I will eat. Then what I showed you earlier, the sakite atena, he says the things I will eat or he wants to eat, this kind of more general, ambiguous, reported intentionality construction, more, more vague one. Then the true desiderative that has grammaticalized from the reported in intentionality, so saning kitena, I want to eat. Then there's also just sakite, which is the reported part here in, so this is actually two layers of uh, reported, uh, reported direct speech, reported speech. Um, so sakite is sort of a cohortative or immediate future, so let me eat or I'll eat right now. Um, and then we also have uh, an immediate future, Sarong Kitena. Okay, so there's really, you know, they really kind of made good use of this uh, te in different kinds of constructions. Okay, um, but we also find this T elsewhere. So Franco here has the full paradigm of affirmative future based on T. Okay, uh, we see here the lexical verb is not marked in any way. So again, in, in one time we would have the, the vang here, but they just have the lexical verb. It's not clear, like, because uh, in one time also these things already have started to fuse and kind of you don't often, so what I, um, so this is actually also originally pe vang kite, uh, but now just gets fused to peng kite. So you could kind of see that this could, you know, over time just phonologically erode 
out of the thing. So maybe you know it's possible that there used to be something else on the lexical verb, but you cannot you know see it anymore, hear it anymore. Um, not sure. Uh, same in Cypherium. Here we see, a, uh, or however, that in second person we actually have a different construction that I will uh, mention a bit later. In Chore, we see that for first person we still get remnants of potentially the same bang, just here a velar nasal. Okay, you can see it's sing kanti and sing eighty. Okay, um, so this is again a Barak Valley language, so here we also have some kind of marker on the lexical verb, okay, so maybe it's still possible to reconstruct marking of the lexical verb of the kind that we have in Monsang also. Uh, and we see here again sort of this patchy paradigm where kind of different person forms follow or make use of different constructions, okay. <laughs> And sometimes, really, like it's not always the same combination. So here we had second person being a different construction, whereas first and third make use of direct speech. Here we have, you know, first person singular and second person plural making use of a different construction. So it's, you know, what's going on? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's also possible, you know, in the end that uh, it's just. Um, Epiphenomenal of that particular elicitation session with that particular speaker, which you know I don't want to rule out at this point. Uh, it's Potang uh, Haukip's data, and um, you know I don't know what the circumstances were of how we collected these forms. Um, um, so here in Ranglong, we also have kind of a full set. We see um, interesting double indexation here with both the. Pre-verbal kai and the final ng, and he says this form is used when somebody really wants to, you know, uh, state very with high confidence the intention that they will go. Then you can, you know, put the first person singular marker there twice. And in biate, we again see the same construction, and again with sort of this velar nasal remnant on the lexical verb. Okay, so that does seem to be there here and there. So maybe it's really part of the original construction. Okay, and in Lamkang, um, I've now realized we actually um, probably have the same thing. Um, so this is the paradigm um, that you guys give in your paper, and then the, the footnote here is for alternate forms, and the alternate forms are, um, so ibni or ibnikdi, yeah? And nikan or nikandi, ibna or ibnadi, and naandi, okay? So that D sure looks suspicious, I was and just ask you that. Yeah. Question, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, so I've been realizing it's probably it, it, uh, it's interesting. So the ni we still find for uh, first person, but it's no longer there in second person. Okay, and then here, this sure looks just like uh, inflected forms of to say um, with a D instead of a T. But I have a story for that. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, context. Yeah, not a story. Context. Um, exactly. And so it does seem to be a regular uh, correspondence. Okay, so it's essentially the same construction, apparently. Uh, in Anal, they kind of generally have different future constructions, but they also actually have... So this is the desiderative, which is exactly the same as in, in Monsang, actually. Okay, so it's also Ning which we had also in, in Monsang, right, which is kind of a fixed first-person singular form of the verb. And then this the, which actually, depending on dialect, can be the, da, or di. And I think it actually fused with another form, which is to do, which in Monsang, Monsang is tu. So I think they just kind of fused. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah. So this is kind of the same visitor of construction as in Monsang. But then, kind of, it didn't like the in an I. You don't have sort of this uh, further um, development of, of constructions based on this say verb, as uh, we have in Monsang. Okay, and then yeah, like you just said. So this is actually the fact that we have a D initial in an I and Lamkang is actually what we would expect, because we also have other correspondences of uh, de to t from proto here, proto -South central but uh, I also put some Monsung forms in comparison. So that is really, um, yeah, really what we would expect. Okay, so that works. 
Um, we also have this TE-based construction, this reported speech-based construction in Northeastern. Uh, interestingly here, it's the negative. <laughs> okay, so kind of the knee construction that in Northwestern is only the negative. We saw the example of Northeastern where it was affirmative and here, so it's always kind of <laughs> in the opposite polarity. Um, here we have the TE construction in the negative for negative uh, conjugation in TADO. Um, and the velar nasal, uh, again, on the side of the lexical verb, um, presumably in, in 50 for second person, could just be a assimilation of the velar nasal to the na, um, and then perhaps in, for third person in 53, uh, a fusion, but, you know, potentially. Okay, so this development from direct speech to future is something that is not uh, attested in this baby at all um, diachronic typology of tense aspect mood systems but it is found uh, in other languages in other parts of the world okay so we find it in um, in Africa quite uh, robustly like in different uh, branches and uh, we find it in Papuan languages and um, Gildemann in his work on uh, comparative, um, sort of across Africa comparative approach, um, kind of gives enough data to suggest a pathway that it um, again starts with, out with intention, that's apparently sort of the common thing for all future constructions, um, going through immediate future and then becoming a general future. Okay, uh, so that was our Tebe's constructions. Now we have another form that's actually also quite common uh, and that's a form something like rang or frang or ra or rong so there's quite a bit of variation and of course that's something we always have to be a bit careful whether we really have the same form or there's either another form that's also playing into it or if it's a fusion somewhere along the pathway um, so in ana we have uh, frang which is really a very uh, still transparent as actually a purpose marker and um, which in general seems to be sort of the, the etymology of this of this wrong form also where it's kind of fully grammaticalized as a future marker but here we still recognize it as a, as a purpose marker so it's the same da, da, di what we saw before but again it's say, think and do more generally and this is how you do um, how you express trying in an cognitive constructions, okay? So, um, I try to beat you is, I say, think, do, uh, in order for you to beat. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Obvious, right? <laughs> um, okay, so here's an example. And here it's not, uh, it's not future, but it's kind of the same construction that then in other languages can be reanalyzed as a future construction. So. Here at Chiru, we have a combination of rang with ni, and that's the main affirmative future in Chiru. Okay. Uh, in Monsang, I showed you earlier this um, slide with all these different te based constructions, and we have the Sarong Kitena, which I would um, assume is the same marker that also originates in this purpose marker, um, although I'm not sure about the vowel, what, what the O is about. Um, we find the rang in, in Chore, okay, so this is also the slide I showed you before, and uh, we see first person singular and second person plural um, are based on this rang construction. And then Lamkang, you have the ra, right, uh, nicely with the nominalization that you would ex yeah, yeah. Yeah, that you would expect if it's a purpose marker, right? Uh, if it's kind of originally sort of a purpose postpositional type of thing. Um, okay, in rung long you have the full paradigm with this rung. Um, so you find it also quite uh, widespread both in Barak Valley languages uh, as well as in Chandel. In the LSI, um, yeah, we can also read about for example, um, that this rung is used along with the form ding, 
Um, and both are also employed as post positions with the meaning to or for the sake of. Okay, so just more confirmation that we're dealing with a form that originally has this purpose um, function with nouns or noun phrases and uh, gets used within um, sort of at the verbal level to express future. Okay. And then, as a special treat, <laughs> I can present to you Carby, uh, which actually has the same uh, cognate. Um, must be a cognate. <laughs> it's in Carby um, really just kind of in a spectral marker of about to, uh, which you can see because it's, it combines with the realis marker. So in Carby, there's no tense aspect. Uh, so there's, there's aspect markers, but it's not really tense marking, instead you have sort of the basic, um, you know, like Burmese sort of, it's all about sort of realis, irrealis. Uh, so you have one basic realis marker and two basic irrealis markers. So it combines more commonly with the realis marker. Uh, my house is about to flood, she's about to finish weaving the mat. Um, so that's more common to have it with the realis marker. And then I asked, well, can you also combine it with the irrealis markers? And then I was given two examples, and this is one of them, and um, the examples I got was, if we eat raw meat, we will immediately feel like vomiting, so this is clearly not future because it's this general context, right? So it's um, you know very obvious that it's uh, not indicating future here in any way, it's just sort of a spectral marker of something uh, being about to, to happen, okay? But really feels like it must be cognate, obviously. Okay. Um, so, okay, we talked about ni, we talked about te, and then rang was still pretty widespread, and now we, come, we get to the truly other constructions that are really um, just in one or two languages. Uh, so we have na, perhaps to start with, uh, which is actually the future marker in anal, and, um, you know, this must be... Uh, Presumably, ultimately related to the na nominalizer, instrumental, applicative, um, locative, uh, which I still don't. I'm not really sure how they all hang together. But like a general nominalizer. Mm -hmm. um, in Monsang, okay, just a. Right to this example, in Monsang it's actually, you use it as a purpose nominalizer. So there you would have sort of the, again, the, this purpose function that we also saw with Rang, so that would be sort of also plausible here. Um, in the negative future, this is um, sort of the regular expression for future, this Na. Um, anal is uh, interesting because in the affirmative future, it seems like you also originally have na, at least that's what you see in third person, in the third person context, okay? There you, so you have here, tra na mi, it is not good, where mi is the, um, the negative, and then you have tra na ka, where ka is, you know, one of the other equational copulas that are around in South Central. Um, so that looks, you know, perfectly regular, all good, except that uh, for all other person forms, you don't have the na, but you have funny things happening where the verb becomes, uh, gets a different tone, okay? So you change from low tone tra to high tone tra and you lengthen the vowel. So, you know, maybe it's some sort of fusion of tra and na, but if it is, then it's uh, still something irregular because you don't, you know, otherwise you should also get it in third person, right? It's tra ka and you don't. So it's something interesting going on with, um, in the case of speech check participants here in, um, the anal affirmative future paradigm. Okay, uh, then you have this ngai form that uh, is just in, I think so far I've only found it in, in Cypriam, one of the Barak Valley languages, uh, only here in second person, uh, as well as uh, transitive, uh, I think in the transitive paradigm, so transitive negative paradigm here, um, sort of more regularly. Uh, so this ngai must be the reflex of the verb for uh, love or long for, and desideratives are of course a prime source for futures, just like in English, will, right? <laughs> then you have a form bo, 
which combines with Ni here in Ranglong, and I have no clue, you know, neither, neither did uh, Pautang, but no clue where it comes from, but some sort of form, Bo. There's actually a Bo also in Carby that is some kind of um, uncertainty marker. I don't know if they could be related, but really, who knows? Um, and uh, also wanted to show you this. Um, so, Pautang, how keep, um, documented for Ranglong, sort of these parallel uh, future constructions that you can have to express different, so he expresses it here as, or maps it onto different degrees of likelihood or certainty that an event will happen. Um, so then you have sort of these different constructions that map onto um, likelihood or certainty. Um, I'm not sure that that's really sort of only this one dimension. It's you know, this rung is, uh, if we compare it with the rung in Monsang, which was immediate future, and the Carby rung that was about to, so, um, you know, if something is more of an immediate future, it would be also the likeliest, because then it's about to happen, and then the more sure you can be that it can, that it will really happen. Um, okay, so this situation that you have different future constructions with different, you know, uh, sort of, yeah, a different uh, epistemic certainties. Um, that's that only happens in a firm, for affirmative context. Okay, so negative, just like we always see, uh, negative um, contexts are generally display fewer um, alternatives. Okay, they're just usually more reduced. Okay, a last form. Uh, then we're through. Is uh, form sick, which we find in. Cypherium only transitive paradigm. So Cypherium is a language where intransitive and transitive future constructions uh, work completely differently. And here we have this this form sig, which in the affirmative is only used in first person acting on second person, and the negative is used sort of regularly. Um, and we also find the same sig form in com. Um, we find it again uh, sort of regularly in, in the affirmative and in the negative we actually have remnants of the knee I think that are with with the sick construction being sort of a more innovative construction and you know Ning sort of having gone its own way because it's originally first person singular form but um, you know somehow it was reanalyzed as the future marker and then showing up um, also in other person forms like third person singular here and in the inclusive okay so um, what we've seen is um, just sort of a list again. Wait, I'm running over time. Oh, no, it's okay. Okay. You can. Okay. okay, I'll wrap up quickly. So we have seen the knee, which is um, originally our equational copula, but we find it in this presumably um, obligation or predestination construction to mark future. Then we have seen the T or T, which is reported speech construction which may or may not have always been um, a secondary construction, so secondary in the sense that in Monsang and some other languages we have the lexical verb marked with, you know, perhaps to go or something else. Um, so then, you know, it would have been sort of perhaps first being sort of an allative construction, you know, I go buy a book, uh, becoming I will buy a book, and then I say I go buy a book, um, sort of future being sort of in, in two um cycles sort of um, still still visible now through two different uh, markers, both the va and the te or ti. Um, then we have the ra rung with all its sort of um, form, like variation in terms of form, being based on this purpose um, etymology. Um, and then sort of the less widespread ones, we have na again with this purpose or sort of general nominalizing function. We've seen, you know, going as far as just having future indicated by tone change uh, combined with vowel length and ana with unclear history. We've seen ngai, which must have started out as a desiderative, becoming a future, which is uh, cross-linguistically common. Potentially this va as uh, go and allative sources are um, also common future sources cross-linguistically and this bo and sik forms where I don't know where they're from, where they come from or what their story would be. Um, and so this is again just to show you um, again sort of split up by whether a particular form occurs in the affirmative versus a negative construction and here we just see the yellow form the yellow highlights are forms that occur in um, 
negative constrictions as well. Um, so ni being the primary form for negative future, ngai and sig only occur in negative future paradigms in the case of transitive verbs, okay, so that's actually kind of limited and otherwise all of the diff all of this variation of forms is only found with affirmative future constructions. Okay, so affirmative future constructions, um, what we've seen that we is that we have typically multiple um, constructions, um, sort of either, you know, some of them expressing sort of different degrees of certainty or likelihood or temporal proximity, something's about to happen. We've seen sort of non paradigmaticity and that different person forms have follow different constructions. Sometimes transitive verbs follow different future constructions than intransitive verbs. And uh, I didn't really talk about this, but for Com, I collected data from three different uh, people and got three different <laughs> uh, paradigms. And so it seems like it's, you know, kind of this innovation you also see, unsurprisingly, also at the level of different dialects. Um, then sometimes we have combinations of different elements. So we've seen in, in Carby the combination of va with te to say. We've seen uh, in um, Chiru the combination of rang and ni. So sometimes we have sort of different elements which um, could be either sort of diachronic layering or you know combinations of form used for a particular construction. But generally we see a high rate of innovation and for affirmative future constructions this quotative type construction. Um, is very common. In negative future constructions, um, that's much more sort of unified. Uh, we have uh, generally the combination of a, a negative marker nor ma together with ni. Um, and when we have innovations for negative future, it's only in transitive paradigms. Okay, so basically we can identify intransitive negative future as a very conservative um, type of paradigm. Okay. Okay, so contextualizing this within South Central, um, the next steps, of course, will be to kind of, um, you know, now that we kind of know what uh, constructions we find in Northwestern, so the question, how does that relate to other South Central languages? Um, and how, you know, sort of, yeah, applying it to kind of trying to make progress with uh, South Central, how does that help us with identifying or telling apart sort of uh, inheritance from contact. Um, the question is whether occurrences of the same construction would be more likely instances of borrowings or of common inheritance. Um, generally affirmative constructions, uh, because there's such a high amount of variation, um, you know, if you find the same type of construction in two different languages, you'd be more inclined to think that it's uh, contact just because you have all this variation. Um, but it's not clear that it's really that useful in tracking contact just because there's really so much variation that it's, that it's kind of, you know, almost uh, seems like too much variation to really be able to, to track this properly. Um, and then again, what we've seen is that particularly intransitive negative future constructions, that's, um, that's conservative and stable. And so if anything, that would be um, potentially indicative of um, a phylogenetic grouping to, to try to yeah, assess, um, find criteria for phylogenetic groups. Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you.